Dude, do you have any idea how sick Sahagan are? Yeah, they're pretty tough. No, man, you just aren't getting it. You want to see how they come into this world? Sahagan hatchlings. Rolling through the waters in the final enemy, these swarms of Sahagan hatchlings are dangerous to any creature they encounter. Other Sahagan avoid the swarms, while the individual members devour one another until only the strongest hatchlings are left to grow to maturity. Oh, crap! The adults won't even go near their young? Now, I've heard of some species where the adults will eat their young, but never have heard of the young eating their parents. So let's talk about D&D monsters, the Sahagan, how to survive. Welcome to Nerdarchy, for nerds by nerds. I'm Nerdarchist Dave, and as always, I'm hanging out with this nerd. Nerdarchist Ted. Maybe this is the first time visiting Ted's basement. It's a place where we like to talk about news, views, and homebrews for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Sometimes we talk about other role-playing games. So if you don't want to miss a single video, don't forget to crit hit that subscribe button and to tune to that notification bell. Time for another D&D Monsters Against the Sahagan, How to Survive. All right, so with the, uh, you know, recently released Ghosts of Salt Marsh, we figured, you know, why not dive into a nice aquatic monster like the Sahagan? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're a ton of fun. Been one of my favorites since the uh, early editions of the game. There was a great trilogy by Mel Autumn called Threat from the Seas, which featured them as the main antagonist, the main baddies, if you would. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, how can you go wrong using a monster that, you know, has the nickname Sea Devils? All right, so we're going to break this down into three different categories. We're going to talk about the monster. We're going to talk about how the players deal with or contend with the monster, maybe some tips, uh, and then what the DM can do or should do using the monster. All right, so right in the monster manual, the core book, we get three different versions of the Sahagin, and they are CR half. Same as an orc, there's a CR2, and there's also a CR5. But if you dive into Ghosts of Salt Marsh, you get a whole lot of new options. Yeah, they do add a bunch of them. In Ghosts of Salt Marsh, they add seven new stat blocks, one through six. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of great stuff in there, and including what I talked about in that intro, is a, ha a hatchling swarm. Totally amusing. I can't wait to use that in an aquatic game myself. I don't think your players are going to be laughing, my friend, <laughs> at all. So we've got 10 Sahagin options now that you can throw at your players and with a full range that you're going to be able to challenge them for a while. Yeah, well, at that point in time, we're looking at, what, half to a si to challenge six? That's a, that's a credible threat, if you ask me. Absolutely. Now let's kind of dive into the Sahagin as a monster, as a race, what people can expect. All right. We, we already talked about them being called sea devils. You know, they're an aquatic race. And because they claim territory, like so many of these different monstrous humanoids, they've come into, you know, wars and battles so many times with sea elves that they're kind of like their mortal enemy. They hate them. They despise them. And... They're also pretty prone to mutations, and sometimes, you know, it, it goes in a variety of different ways, but one specific way is a Malenti, a Sahagan, Sahagan, however you prefer to pronounce it. They're born looking exactly like sea elves, and therefore they send the Malenti into sea elf culture to uh, act as a spy, as assassins, and it, it usually goes bad for the sea elves. Yeah, Sahagin in general can be very cantankerous. Not only do they constantly war with sea elves, but they're not overly fond of the Kotoa, and they also despise and hate Tritons as well. The feeling is mutual. Although, even though they don't particularly like Kotoa, they will sometimes ally with them. They're closer to the fish people than they are to the Tritons or the sea elves in looks and appearance. As so. well as disposition. Now, also, a very part of their society is based off of the religion, and they, they venerate, revere, maybe even fear, Sokola, which is basically this savage, giant, ravaging shark god. And you know, I guess because of their attachment to that, or maybe because of blessings from Sokola, all Sahagin naturally have the affinity and, you know, allies with, with sharks. They, they can all telepathically command sharks. Typically, you know, no action required. They just be like, Fight. Yeah, they're, they are definitely the Aquaman of D&D, &D, but only for sharks. 
So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, ways that you can use that. And we'll get into that later. So, you know, going along with the religious and faith beliefs of the Sahagin is he who eats and it that is eaten. So, I mean, this kind of stems to their, you know, the, the old adage that the Sahagin have is meat is meat. Uh, they don't really care whether it was sentient or not. They just eat whatever they kill. Well, not only that, too, even in previous editions, they were very much depicted as being cannibals as well. If it was dead, that's where kind of where the saying comes from, meat is meat. So, you know, if, you know, if the Sahagin falls in battle, they will eat their own. So, you know, along the lines of, you know, Sokola's power uh, in Sahagin society, only females are worthy to wield the divine power of Sokola, uh, which is why, you know, in your monster manual, it is only a female priestess. We already mentioned that Sahagin are prone to mutations. If they are born near a, a sea elven society or, or, or city or culture, there's a possibility you get Malenti out of them. Well, also, the Barons are another mutation from the Sahagin, and these are bigger than normal Sahagins, and they also have four arms. So you've already got a savage creature that has, you know, claws, that has teeth, you know, wields weapons, and now it's got four arms and it's bigger. So typically, the other Sahagin bow to the might, to the majesty of these superior Sahagin. That's why they're called barons. Yeah, well, and it only makes sense because it's, because it is definitely a might makes right type of society. Now, if you want more ways to use Sahagin, if you want more Sahagin in your game, Ghost of Salt Marsh is a great way to do it. But there's another way. There's more. There is our sponsor, Frog God Games has a Kickstarter going on right now, Sea King's Malice. It is written by Alex Kamer, who is also uh, runs Game Hole Con and has been in the D&D community for a very long time. So they have an aquatic adventure over there from levels one all the way up to, was it level 10? Level 10. To level 10. And oh my gosh, the art looks fantastic on this thing. The, the art is amazing, but you know... If you want to dive into this, you know, some of the options, you can literally get the ecology of the Sahagin. Well, that's one of the books in addition to the Sea King's Mouse. So that's two books. There's also the Dead Man's Chest. This is another book that may get unlocked. And there's two more adventures as well. So there's a lot of options. So down in the description below, you're going to find a link to go check out that Kickstarter. Highly recommend you do so. As Dave says, the art is amazing. There's a lot of great stuff in it. And there are so many options that we can't even talk about them all here. And not only that, it's already funded. It just went up today as we're filming this video. So if you back this Kickstarter, you know you're getting your book. I can only imagine they're going to start nailing these stretch goals and knocking them out of the park. Barlow's and Grimm are also involved. They're doing the maps and a lot of the accessories as well. And uh, Some of those accessories are going to be limited edition. So if you don't get them while they're there, you're not going to be able to. So do us a favor. Go down in the description. Take a look at that Kickstarter. And let's get back to talking about Sahagin and what you can do as a player when you're faced by the sea devils. All right, so our first topic is, you need magic to talk to them. So if you actually look at all the Sahagin staff blocks, they only speak Sahagin, Sahagin. And, you know, that, that's because they have no desire to really learn your culture. They have no desire to, you know, learn common because they don't care about others. So if you don't take the time to learn their language, you're gonna need, you know, tongue. You're gonna need some kind of magic to be able to communicate. And that's if for some reason something is going on is actually going to give you the chance because usually you're in their area, they're just going to attack. You are a food item to them. You are on the menu. So chances are pretty good that they're not going to be willing to talk or negotiate with you. Now, I will say the priestesses do have tongues on their spell list, so they could talk to you if they wanted to, but chances are you're dinner. <laughs> So next up, we already kind of mentioned, you know, briefly that they have the ability to command sharks. So if you're playing an aquatic druid, don't turn into a shark. If you're playing any other kind of spellcaster with polymorph, do not polymorph your allies into sharks or yourself. Because there is no saving throw. There is no, oh, they cast charm. No, they just mentally command you no actions, just do, 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 and you're there. So don't do it. Technically, it's not even labeled as a charm effect. So even if you're immune to the charm effect, I don't even think that's going to help you. By raw, the way it's worded, obviously, now if the DM in your game might run it differently, you're the DM, you have the options to run it however you want. 
but by by what's written yeah it doesn't say it's a charm it doesn't say it takes an action if there is no saving throw you just become their their puppet all right here's a big one <laughs> don't bleed whatever you do and it doesn't matter if you're in the water or out of the water but just don't bleed all right so i know it's really hard to get into combat and not take damage not bleed but as with the sagan's uh, affinity towards sharks Sharks kind of go crazy when their prey is bleeding. Well, so do the Sahagan. They have that attachment to sharks naturally, and therefore they go crazy. They get into a blood frenzy when something is bleeding. So they wind up getting advantage on attack rolls with someone who's not at max hit points. Obviously, you might not have control over this. You can't keep yourself from bleeding, and they're trying to make you get hurt. So you, there's nothing you can do about that. But the tip that we can give, if you are the players and you have healers in your group try and keep as many of your allies up to full hit points as possible you're going to want to spend extra healing in order to negate that frenzy ability so that they don't get advantage at least on every single attack uh, you can use the, the the help action to give your allies advantage you you can you know use protection abilities or defensive abilities to increase your your allies armor class whatever fighting styles you can take to, to really bump that up and make yourself harder to hit, harder to damage, it, it's definitely going to go a long way towards surviving encounters against the Hagen. The protection fighting style, maybe to offset that advantage or give them disadvantage so you can stop them from getting that frenzy off. So you made mention, you know, that the, the bleeding, you know, works for their advantage, whether you're in the water or out. But if you're in the water... That's going to be bad news because, you know, chances are the DMs going to be like, well, there's sharks around and I can command sharks. So we're going to add some allies. So don't get in the water. If you are a player and you're fighting shipboard, whatever you do, try not to allow the Sahagin to get you into the water. Try and get your allies out of the water as fast as possible, because like Ted said, their shark allies are there which are also believe have a frenzy ability that they're going to get to use. It's their natural environment. It, you know, you're going to get a disadvantage on a lot of your actions. If you're a spellcaster and you or the Sahagin are in the water, any fire spells are going to be uh, against resistance because of being in the water. So it's just better to not let them get, that, get you there at all costs. You're going to need a good defensive plan in order to keep this from happening. If I'm the GM, I'm probably going to try and scoop up players and dive into the water with them so that the Sahagin can fight them, you know, in their native environment. Uh, and they need to be in the water, you know, every so often. So for, for them, it's more natural to be in the water. So it makes a lot of sense. So with that, we've kind of already kind of broached going into the DM section. Let's let's take the full plunge and talk about how the DM can use the Sahagan in their game. All right. We mentioned we made mention earlier that you know they're prone to mutations. So if you're the kind of DM like myself where you like to create stat blocks. You know, you can use your your stat blocks that are in the monster manual and in Ghost of Salt Marsh and say, well, I want to mutate that. I want to I want to add this and become something different. Maybe you're inspired by other aquatic life that exists in real life, or maybe you want to add a feature that's similar to another aquatic monster. You can go ahead and attach it to a Sahagan and have something that is unique to your world of the year game. But not only that, if they also are near another culture or another society, you could use that same principle with the Malenti of, oh, every so often when, when they're born, they absorb you know, traits of nearby communities. And, and it works really easy like that. They're, so they're kind of like really adaptable. I think for that reason, they're, they're a lot of fun. So another thing you can do is the GM, especially if you want to make for a more interesting combat but you don't want to overwhelm your players all at once, and that is to use waves. Ted loves using waves in, in his games. So the idea is the party is fighting against a group of Sahagin. The party begins winning and thinning the herd. The remaining Sahagin call forth sharks with their telepathy. They bring them in. The battle continues. You get to deplete more of the party's resources and not overwhelm them all at once. So it's a, it's a way to challenge them and use mo more monsters at the same time. So I, I enjoy, as Dave says, I enjoy doing this. And, you know, round two, round three, you can add, add more monsters. You know, with being in the water, it's very easy for 
things to be passing by. There is a range on the Sahagan's telepathy. So when something comes into range, you're the DM, you have control of this. You know, they, they come in, you, you call them, and oh no, round two, we get to add a new combatant. And it's a lot of fun. Round three, you could do the same thing. And the, and the party will see the resource drain. And it'll be more challenging as opposed to just being, you know, an, an outright slaughter. Right, just overwhelm. And also one of the interesting things you could do is, you know, you could literally have the cavalry come in to aid the Sahagan because sharks range anywhere from medium up to huge in size. So you could have large sharks ridden by more Sahagan as they come into the battle, or you could even have a huge shark coming in, to, you know, with three or four Sahagan on it. So you could either have them, you know, with a custom saddle built to the sharks, or you could have the shark have like straps that the Sahagan just kind of hold on to and quote unquote ride. And because the huge shark has a faster swim speed than the Sahagan, it can get in the in the battle quicker. And how terrifying would it be to have this huge shark, you know, swimming fast through the waters, tailing an, an army of Sahagan? Absolutely, it'd be fearsome indeed. So also interesting enough, um, talking about the sharks, their CRs actually match up in the monster manual, the same as the Sahagan, half two and five. That's a lot of fun, and that does give you the ability to really, you know, m make for an interesting encounter, however you want to want to build it. Your shark could be your big bad, followed by a bunch of just regulars, or you could totally have, you know, a huge shark being ridden by a baron and just, you know, coming to play Trump on the on the bad guys or the good guys in this case. If you were to do something like an underwater battle, which would be really epic, maybe you're inspired by the Aquaman movie and the players are allied with Tritons or sea elves and they're facing off against an army of Sahagan and a bunch of them are riding, you know, the large sharks, the hunter sharks, I believe, are the large. And the Baron, like you said, is riding that that giant shark. That would make for an impressive front coming at the players. So, you know, given that, you know, the all of the sharks and the Sahagan, they have frenzy. So when you're describing the battle, you really want to get into the frenzy. So when one person gets a gets attacked and they start bleeding. Everything should be frothing, you know, I mean, I don't know how well you can froth at the mouth underwater, but you get the idea. Like, they, they should really be getting into it. They become agitated. They're moving faster. You know, you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in, in, in the way they move as is a, you know, unfair tactic. But everything should then gang up on that thing until it drops. And, you know, you could if you want to be a, a, a merciless DM. You could just keep attacking and outright kill a player, uh, acting as the monsters would, keep attacking until they've eaten it. Uh, I, I don't play that harsh in my games. You know, I'll attack until it's down, then move on to the next target. But that would be apropos for the creature. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, sharks and Sahagan, really, because they're so primitive and, and savage, probably would continue to attack a downed opponent because they might actually begin to eat, eat it. That first strike is going to be crucial in you know, describing as a DM. You know, as the Sahagan, even if it just barely clips the player for a point of damage and the little whiffs of blood begin drifting through the water and maybe the players actually see the Sahagan inhale it. And then they, they visibly see a change in the Sahagan or the sharks as well that signals something has changed in the battle. Something is different. Things are about to get ugly. Yeah, and, and as Dave says, like, you know, describe that moment. Take the time to break away from the standard, uh, you know, combat initiative sequence and get into that narrative mode. Maybe you want to have something, you know, pre-written that you can get into. And this is going to enhance and possibly worry and stress your players that you have broken from this, this typical norm and pulled out a description. You're going to have them offset and like, maybe I need to run. <laughs> now, especially like if you have rangers or druids that are from a coastal area, maybe they're familiar with sharks, but maybe not Sahagan. When that happens, that player recognizes, or the player's character recognizes the traits in a shark when they're about the frenzy in the Sahagan. And then you can kind of like describe that and give that player that knowledge that their character would have to know that, so, especially if they're unfamiliar with the Sahagan, you know, so it'll be like, like in that eye opening moment when, oh no, things have just gotten more dangerous. I, I agree. Uh, so the last little tidbit we want to give to DMs is the ability to use these as a protracted, uh, you know, campaign, a villain. 
there's a lot of options between one and six. We've got, we've already made mention that you can add other variations, mutations, if you will, should you so desire. But there are a number of creatures that they already ally with, um, you know, that you could then use as inspiration and have as a long drawn out campaign. I don't know, like the Kraken or, you know, the, the juvenile Kraken that's in here. If you want to have a, a shorter campaign and, and these are just, you know, some of the options, but given what's there, you could easily have this just be, these are your campaign villains. These are what you're going to use for the breath of the game. I could absolutely see a, a tribe or a clan of Sahagan worshiping a kraken or a dragon turtle as their living god you know maybe they've gone away from the tenets of Sokola and they've they've moved into a different direction and they follow these things instead well maybe they believe that that specific kraken or dragon turtle present um certain qualities and therefore that's an avatar of their god you know you can use the stat block change the the description a little bit and have it be an agent of Sokola, have it be an avatar, if you will, without actually having to do any more work besides changing a little bit of visuals. Another two monsters I would like to point out is the Myriad and the Morkoth. Both of them are super intelligent and would make uh, great masters for the Sahagan. The Myriad is basically an evil genie of the, from the plane of water, so that would fit perfect. The Morkoth is this weird creature that has hypnotic powers, as well as it's this hybrid monstrosity of between like humanoid and then and, and, like a squid or an octopus. A lot of options if you want to use Sahagin in your games. So those are just some, some tips that uh, we figured out. Now, if you've got some tips you would like to share, there's a place for it down in the comments. But before you go, we want to invite you to join the Nerdarchy <laughs> Adventuring Party over on Patreon. What can they expect over there, Ted? We're creating products every month for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons that players and DMs alike can drop right into their game. And also, to, don't forget our patrons are automatically entered into monthly giveaways. We also have a weekly hangout with our patrons and more. So quest down to the description where you can join the Nerdarchy Adventuring Party over on Patreon. You'll also find a link to that Kickstarter as well. And until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.